Hi everybody, welcome to this lovely afternoon on NAP10 and today we're doing school buses and levels of, of permissions is kind of the focus that we've got. The first thing we'll do is going to run through a welcome and some icebreakers. Um, we're only going to do 20 people as there's 19 people, we'll, we'll stick to 19 and it's going to be nice, fast, brief, brief, brief. Um, one of the reasons for getting everybody to talk is it provides a sound check, make sure that you're able to hear us and we're able to hear you. Um, we'll run through the plan for today. We'll talk about school bus stops. Hopefully that's going to be a nice sort of short 10, 15 minutes. And then we're going to get into the big meat of it, which is all about what it means to manage a stop, what it means to be an agent for a stop, what it means to be a policy manager. And are those the right words to use? Are those the right levels? Do we have the right ideas of how your hierarchies fit together? And who should we tell about those things? And then who that? which is how do we know when you ask us for an account that we know that it's you? And how do we know that it's not you if somebody tries to pretend to be you? And then we'll, we've got some feedback and we've got a few ideas. Um, and we'll talk about what's coming up next and where we're at. So running back to the start, icebreaker. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go down the list alphabetically as it's showing for me. Um, so we're going to do an icebreaker. You're going to give me your name. You're going to give me your pronoun. So if I refer to you, should I use he, she or they? Um, where you're from uh, in terms of company and things like that. And the best colour for a bus. So let's quickly run through the plan for today just to make sure that everyone's up because there's a, a other quick small thing to run through. So the first one up was we're going to go through school bus stops. How are we handling them? Because I know that they're an and I'll talk about why they're an issue and, and what's going on. And I want to see how the different local authorities are handling them, because I think you're all handling them slightly differently. And I'd like to kind of open that discussion of how uh, how everyone's handling them and then look at what's a good way forward for everybody. And then we're also going to go through and talk through the permission layers that we want to start looking at for new NAPTAN. So current NAPTAN has something. We're not quite sure what seems to be one or two levels, it's a bit weird. We're trying to sit down and, and ensure that we've got all the permission levels right and we know how to know who you are. There was a question that came up last time when I tackled all of this, which is who is legally responsible when something happens at a bus stop? So we took this to the DFT legal people and they have come back with these two paragraphs. So, um, I will leave it there for you to read and come back to. Um, I effectively they're saying there is no that there is no provisions, there is no statutory provisions, and please go seek your own legal advice. So um, that's kind of where it's at. I know that there was a question that came up because we used the word responsible for who was who somebody is responsible for bus stops, and this was one of the questions that was raised. So I just wanted to tackle it very early and very head, head on. So the next bit, bus, uh, school buses. Why are we talking about school buses? Because BODS made a decision that school, closed school services, that services that only pupils can catch needed to be put into BODS. So this means that we need to talk about the stops for closed school buses. So there's stops where no other, where no public buses stop. So some of these, for example, we were given the examples of um, there will be a couple of families down the end of a farm lane or something, and the school bus will stop to pick up the, the children of that family to take them to the specific schools. What we're not talking about is stops where both a public bus and a school bus stop or services where the members of the public can catch an open school bus. So it might be a bus that's put on for school, but a member of the public can hop on and do a pay as you go or have a ticket stamped or something and still catch the bus. Do these definitions make sense to everybody and have I totally understood the problem? And Stephen, you're about to tell me I've got it wrong, I hope. Now, now just to ask a clarifying question. What's the reason to exclude um, buses and stops where public members of the public can get on a bus or wait for a bus? Because those already should be covered in NAP10. So NAP10 should cover all of the school, all of the bus stops that exist. There is 
um, this is not quite a new requirement. It's a weird extra requirement of how we handle public putting in stops into NAPTAM that the public shouldn't be able to use. So, for example, if it's um, using my example at the end of a farm road or there's some farms that come down and there's a space where a custom stop where the bus stops to pick up the kids, but that's not used by any other bus. It's only going to be used by the closed school buses. How do we put those bus stops in? And those are the ones that we're talking about because all other bus stops, all other types of bus stops are generally picked up already. I'm hoping and I hope that makes sense, Stephen. That I explain does, it yeah, right. it's, I thought it might have been a wider discussion about how you identify school bus stops, um, which is an issue that's been going on for quite a few years. Ah, so that's another. So there's a separate issue here. So today we're going to talk about this one, but I, I will I will run school buses three where we come back to talk about how we identify stops that school buses can use. How okay. does that sound? Yep, that's perfect. perfect. Andrew. Yeah, my my question is, well, it's probably, probably the wrong person, but why do we have to include closed bus contracts on bots? What's the point of it? I don't understand. And two, you mentioned that there may be a stop at the end of a farm lane that the bus will pick up a school child, but potentially that could be classified as a hail and ride stop in Naptan anyway, because bus most bus services in Lincolnshire being rural are registered for hail and ride so if a bus is going on the road and somebody sticks the hand out wherever they are as long as the driver believes it's a safe place to stop they will stop and get picked up so I, I just don't see the the, the point of, of first of all putting school services on bods when they're closed and the kids have to know when to be there anyway and secondly as I say any any say pickup point potentially is a bus stop because hail and ride in, it, it could be in effect. Ah, now that's a really good point and that means that your ones are probably going to be hail and rides. There, this is one of the things that we're trying to uncover is how the different local authorities are handling it because we've seen it in the data coming through in a number of different ways. As to why it's in there, that's a question that I think we need to take to BODS. I am merely the person who's having to try to figure out why there's a lot of weird extra stops that need to be put into NAPTAN for these services and trying to figure out a way forward with it. Um, let's have a chat to BODS about why those should be there. Uh, so, Natasha, I think you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, we use um, school um, bus stops uh, quite a lot. We um, we integrate them with our um, school uh, um, uh, our school back back office as well. Um, so we use all the NAPTAN names, and we um, want them included because. We actually have things like road works and tree cutting and things like this. They need to be in the general um, ATCO um, files to be able to identify um, well um, customers and um, other users to identify exactly, you know, what's going along which road, all buses. <laughs> That's a really good point, and thank you. And I, I, I had one other example, but I'll go to Ian first, and then I'll give the example that somebody gave me as to why they believe these needed to be into BODs, and hopefully that will make some sense as well. So, Ian. Okay, just a few points on this. Uh, if you go back through the PTIC meetings from a number of years ago, I raised this about creating a separate class of bus stop for schools only, because it's not just a rural problem or issue, it's an urban one. We've got urban i can think of ones in clayton i can think in preston where we have got school only bus stops and there's no way of differentiating them within the current nap time secondly is um, in terms of having the closed bus stop services within bods uh, whoever raised that yeah although they're not in there at the moment what you got to wonder about and it's probably a, it is definitely a different environment is where the data for future journey planning systems is going to generate its data from at the moment we throw everything into travel line 
And if you want a complete package and you want because school kids are you know, bus passengers and they're going to be the future use of buses going forward, we want to get them involved in using buses early doors. And if the data isn't in BODS, where they're going to find it if something like the travel line system doesn't continue or BODS becomes the de facto data source. And yeah, that we'll leave it at that one, to be honest. Thank you, Ian. I think those are two really good points. And um, I will raise the question as to whether um, having a separate type of stop would be a good thing. And we can look at that in the future as well. Um, the example that I was given, and I'll just do this before I come to you, Rebecca, was, for example, um, if I'm a kid traveling to school and I've stayed at my grandparents who are a couple of who are a village over and I need to catch a bus to then catch up to my school bus, I, that's a very hard thing to plan if the school bus doesn't show in the journey planners. That was the sort of example that somebody gave of the school buses need to be in there so that people can plan journeys that include the school buses because there are some times people have to catch a bus to get to the school bus um, in some circumstances. And hopefully that example makes sense and sounds relatively realistic. Um, Rebecca. Um, yeah, um, it's sort of like the, the flip side of that that I was thinking about. Um, it's something that, that cropped up um, due to the pandemic that we experienced because traditionally at SIPTI, we, we have only ever processed and included in our data school services that anybody could get on as well. So we could have any, any other paying customer. We didn't actually include, include closed services. Um, and through the pandemic, they, they separated out school services, didn't they? So they were closed just to children. So they, they were separated out and et cetera. So we had then the difficulty of trying to code these services up because also uh, TNDS wasn't set up to separate these out because where the problem lies then is that, OK, children can do that journey planning and get the information they need. But then it was the problem of Norm, normal um, adults doing normal journey plans <laughs> um, that, that were then didn't weren't made aware and you couldn't separate out the fact that these services were closed services and they couldn't get on them there was no way of separating that out in the data to say don't include those services so yeah we know that was an issue in in TNDS and obviously moving forward, that's going to go with, with all be BODS. So what I want to know is if BODS is doing this and wanting these closed services in there, will they have a mechanism for those to be filtered out? Um, I would definitely take that to BODS. Um, so separate out in the data. And I'm also kind of feeling the whole, I should have really brought BODS along on this. Um, and they, uh, no, but they haven't been able to, to come along, but it is there's a lot of extra questions which I had kind of in the back of my mind, but I think you've articulated them really well. Um, so, Andy, just before I come to you, there's we need a separate type, or there's a a desire, perhaps for a separate type of stop to indicate a closed or a stop where a school bus can stop at, and there's the desire to say whether or not a service is open to the public or closed to the public if it's serving a school. Because I kind of imagine a, a bus comes to the village and I can hop on it to go shopping, even if it's a school bus, or there's a bus that comes to the village and I can't hop on it, and I need to know the difference. And I need to know the difference between those two services. Um, so I'll go to Andy and then to Gordon. On that part about uh, filtering out the school services, the closed school services in the trans exchange file that you send to BODS for closed school services, a public use yes or no field, and that will easily filter them out. Obviously, Tim will know more, have more details on that. Oh, that's that's really good to know. So there's actually a field already in there. So part of the question will be, understanding if people's software are able to populate that field correctly and are, and are able to do that. Um, so Gordon and then Tim and Ian, I'm assuming that yours is a legacy hand. Hi, Dr. J. Um, in Scotland, sorry, can you hear? Yes, yes, I yeah. can. 
Aye. Please go ahead. Sorry, in, in Scottish borders, we're a, a huge geographic area with very little population. Our school buses, we actually wouldn't want children to be able to plan other than the plan that they've been issued with. If they stay at their granny's two villages off to the side, it then becomes parental responsibility. So in the vast majority of our school transport, it is running along closed routes. Um, perhaps about 10% is, is shared with public service and they use the NAPTAN stops. As we've moved forward to try and digitalise the school transport, um, this transport is now, <clears throat> now using NAPTAN stops more and more. So we, we would love um, for NAPTAN to be able to define a school only stop, um, but it would be getting used more for uh, journey planning by our, our planning team rather than children choosing a route. That's that's a really good nuance to know, and thank you, Gordon. We'll definitely come and ask more questions about this. I can see this becoming a regular topic. Tim. Yeah, so as Andy says, there's a couple of ways you can deal with it in BODs, either the public use, which is at a service level, so you can block it and identify it at a, at a service level. So, you know, if the whole, if the whole service is is not for public use or for public use but you can also deal with it at an individual stop level so you could say for example um this this stop um can only be used for boarding or or alighting um and you then pick up um whether it's a public stop or not from that town um and so you could say have a stop in school grounds, which is fairly common, and then tell people actually it's um, it's a lighting only, so it wouldn't appear in a journey planner as a stop you could plan a journey from. So there's a number That's of really ways to skin the metaphorical cat. <laughs> That's really good to know, Tim, and I think that's what I, I, I will get to in a moment. I'll just go to Lee first, um, is finding the different ways that you all are skinning the metaphorical cat and how you're all doing this, because um, it's creating a little bit of confusion between us and bods, and getting it from the horse's mouth to mix more metaphors is actually going to be really good. So, um, Lee, you've got some thoughts before we move on. Um, just on, on Tim's comment there, um... It's something we've been thinking about a lot um, about um, setting closed school services to be uh, pick up only, drop down only, and all this kind of thing, uh, drop off only. Um, but obviously, if the stop within school grounds, you set it as set down only, then that is a little bit odd when you then do the afternoon journey for the kids to go home because they're then getting the journey's beginning at a set down only stop, which doesn't really make sense to me. So. I think maybe setting the whole service as closed would be the way I would want to go with that, really. And I think this is kind of some of the questions that I want to ask. And one of the things is that BODS wants to have this idea that there can be no stops that are not in NAPTAN. And this is also trying to figure out where those boundaries are and how much impact that's going to have on people and whether that is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do when it comes to school stops. So what I'd like you to do is, I'm gonna give you two minutes, because I need to run and answer the door and, 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 grab, and grab some more water. I would like you, under how do you handle these if you have them, I'd like you to put on a sticky note, the local authority that you're in and how you handle closed these closed school bus stops. So what you do, whether you mark them as um, public use, yes, no, in the time to, uh, at the service level, whether you call them a specific thing in the stop name, whether you mark them as hail and ride stops and you call them bus stop hail and ride and there aren't really closed ones, how would you do them and how would you indicate in NAP10 using what you've got now that it's a school bus stop? So I'm going to put a timer on for uh, three minutes. I'll give you some time and then we'll just quickly go through that and then we'll talk through it when we come back. Does does that sound a good thing to do? I'm seeing people doing them already, so I think it is. I'll be right back. 
Oh, good. I appreciate everyone putting what they're doing in. This is really going to help us kind of figure this out because this is actually quite a thorny problem um, to try to figure out between us and BODs and ensure that it doesn't super impact on everybody and we don't kind of come in with a solution that just makes no sense to how everyone does it and think about it. So if everyone's finished, I'll start at the top and I'll let, let South Yorkshire spite continue on through. So. Oxford County Council, we simply don't have any school only stops. Stops that are used for the contracted school services never have been registered are not made public. The school contracts team keeps a separate list of them. So just to make sure those ones are, you've got a separate list of those bus stops and those would never be published to BODs. They're never made public at all. Is that correct for, for, for Ox, that, Oxford? That's correct, County? yeah. We're told it's partly, okay. well, I was told originally it was a security thing so that nobody could look at isolated farmhouses and tell where there are children. It may or may that's not be very, the truth, I don't know. That's very much some of the thinking that's going on as well, the privacy piece around this. Uh, in Nottinghamshire, we have created only created school bus stops when they're actually in school grounds. We treat these the same as normal NAPTAN bus stops as they're used by both closed and public services. That's really good to know. So Nottinghamshire, do you use any bus stops where the bus would stop that's not a NAPTAN bus stop for those school services or do you just not record them? Um, we just don't record them. It, it, it's the same as um, Oxford really. We um but it's hold, held by the um the schools team and depends on it particularly in the in the rural county um of the rural areas of the county you'd kind of you'd have somebody getting on at the end of their farm track um for the for however many years of school and then you wouldn't need to pick them up again mm. so what's the point in creating the stop so they they um have that local arrangement with the operator you know can you pick you know, Johnny up for you know from here mm. on your way um, but yeah. otherwise, they try and use um, they try and use the the main bus stop where possible. It's only where there's maybe something unsafe to walk, or you know, it's in the middle of nowhere kind of thing. So, cool. No, that makes that makes a ton of sense. Um, Lee, um, I just wanted to comment um, on the um, unmarked stops in Naptan. Obviously, they are marked. They, the the code is CUS, which I assume stands for custom and practice. Um, so it's obviously I've not worked in the industry that long, but I assume that custom and practice stops, which are often they referred to as unmarked stops, were basically introduced into Naptan as a kind of it's sort of a bus stop, but it sort of isn't a bus stop. It's a custom and practice. This is somewhere where the bus operator has got has got into the habit of stopping, but it was it's not formalised. So in many ways, it feels that custom and practice stops were this solution some years ago, but gradually they've become more and more into the fold and we now treat them as, as normal stops. They're just with the absence of a pole and flag or a shelter. So um, I do sort of wonder whether we sort of, this is a problem that was solved, but then because of the way it's been used, it's those custom and practice stops have become like normal stops in a way. I don't know if I've got a wrong take on that, but it's just a thought. That's a, that's a really good thought. And I might ask Tim to give us the potted, a very short potted history of custom stops in a moment when I finish going through all of these. Trisha. Hi, yeah, sorry, I was just going to, in response to, to Lee's comment about custom and practice stops, um, that one of the reasons they were created as well is for where we have um, villages where we, you know, we only want one piece of infrastructure, but the bus operates on both sides of the road. You need a nap time stop in both directions. So although the flag says both ways, we create the custom um, practice stop for the opposite side of the road. Um, so although f nothing's physically there, that is what the custom um, and practice nap time stop was for. Well, one of the reasons. I always, I always, I always remember like my first meeting with you all, and I said, "What is a bus stop?" And some of you basically said, "It's a patch besides the side of the road. It's a patch of grass where if you stand and wave, the bus will stop." And I was just 
bemused by that because the only bus stops I've ever experienced in my life are kind of stops with poles on them and things like that. I'd never had this notion that you could just stand and wave at, at, at a patch of grass. Well, standing on a patch of grass besides the road. Showing showing my urbanite-ness. Um, I'm just going to quickly continue reading through these. If they have to be in NAP10, at the moment we mark them as authorised users only or similar. Oh, how would you mark them as authorised users only? If somebody could just let me know while I continue going through. Uh, Cumbria. Uh, that was me, Dr. Uh, Dr. J. That was me about the authorised users only. We'd mark it on the route. Uh, so ah, at stop level at, with a with a um, restricted use. So either set down only for the outgoing uh, for the outgoing trip and and um, boarding only for the inbound trip. So that's at service level. Yeah, or trip or whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah. On on trip slash route. That's that's really good to know because I would have gone hunting for that within. Uh, NAPTAN, not within the rest of the TNDS. Uh, first stop is only available for school buses. We've added school buses only to stop name. I love the I love the 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 ease of that one. I think that's I think that's really good. I'll come back to Connect Tees Valley because I can see you're still typing. Gloucestershire County Council. We show the name of the stop plus school stop, i.e. Gloucester Town School Stop, and also have another folder with Travel Line Southwest for contracted school services only. But it, as said, does not help public or colleagues to check whether the bus goes for roadworks and journey planning. So yes, you've caught on a couple of things. One of the BOD's challenges is operators' requirement to submit operational timetables to match with location data for real time, and these include all the locations to pick up kids as stops not a NAPTAN. That profile restricts stops that are not a NAPTAN to two months use maximum. Yes, so we've got a, um, we are trying to work with BODs to find all of the non-NAPTAN stops and understand why some of them exist. Schools is the biggest portion of them, I believe, at the moment. Uh, Tease, I think you've finished writing. Um, we have stops on the highway that are private stops erected by the private school for their own use. These are in NAPTAN but not picked up on served commercial routes. We have other stops on the highway that are solely for the college buses, again not picked up by the commercial services and the data. There are other points within the school grounds where the actual or virtual stops these are not on the highway and would not be served by commercial services. Do not hold details of additional stops used for home to school transport, farm lane, and scenario. School buses are in my database only if they're registered and use public bus stops. Some flags are marked by school services only, but this is because they don't have any commercial services rather than they're specifically for schools. So some are specifically for schools. That's a really complicated piece. Um, Keith, you've got some thoughts. Um. Tim or Tricia might know the answer, but there is a private code in that town, and I don't think it's used much. Um, I don't actually know what it's for, even though I've Googled it, it didn't make sense to me. But if the aim is to get um, closed stops in there, could you not potentially use the private code if it's not used for something else to indicate it was a closed stop, therefore not needing a change in the schema? I don't know. Uh, I can talk about private code because I just had to sort out a problem with it the other day. So how private code appears to be being used is that it's being allowed, it's a non-published. So if you give us the data, we do not publish it because it is private. Um, so it's private information that some people seem to be using to additionally track their assets and things at the bus stops. Um, so very, it's used like some people are using plate code. So what we're doing is we're gonna we're asking the people who use plate code and the people who use private code if this theory is correct. Um, we have two local authorities who use private code, and we have five or six who use plate code. So while stuff in the schema has said to do it this way, there seems to have been a little bit of movement in how people are using it within their software and within their practices. Tim. You've possibly got some more clarification on this. Yeah, Keith, Keith right in the original purpose for for the private code, um, people, 
because Naptan's not properly supported it centrally for a long time, the, the way that it's been used has, has practically has changed over time. Um, and uh, hence why we've got a bit of a problem with it, I think. Yeah, I totally appreciate that. And this is one of the things that we're trying to work on to clear this out. Uh, Lee. Uh, it might be more of a Bob's comment from me, uh, but just on this point about having um, close school uh, journeys in, in, in your data allows you to um, see them for the purposes of road works, road gritting, this kind of stuff. Um, that is true, um, but obviously there are some school services which are exempt from BODs. I, I believe if it's all school children who are on the bus because they're entitled to transport from the local authority, they're entitled children, I believe they, the service doesn't have to be registered um that's only my understanding don't don't quote me on that um and then also there's other types of buses that aren't in scope of bods at the moment such as section 19 section 22 and so on and so forth so although having open um it's closed school sorry rather it, it does help um it doesn't really give you full view of all buses when you're trying to do your network planning I think there's also a connection between BODs and BODs are trying to connect up with real-time data. So if a bus is showing that it's stopping at a stop that's not in BODs, that's not in NAPTAN, that is being flagged as why is the bus stopping there? And this is, I just, I'm, I'm trying to separate out as many of the problems as possible and just focus on the one that we've got at the moment. I know that com that the community buses and some of the other buses have exceptions, um, and we're just trying to understand where the lines are and what stuff from that tan is definitely needed, and can we make this make sense for everybody? Um, so I'm just going to run through um, South Yorkshire as well. I don't believe we have any closed school only. They are either on private land and not ours or a general stops. If only school services stop, there's a times table state school buses only. That's fantastic. Is there anyone who I haven't read? Does anyone have any? Oh, school stops will need to be able to be added and removed easier than normal stops in Naptan. Most definitely. And that's one of the things that we need to look at under archived and deleted is adding and removing stops a little bit better. Is there any? thing that we haven't captured there any way that anyone's capturing it or working with these that we haven't thought of and there will definitely be more on school bus stops and school buses i i i assure you fantastic so what i'd like to do is we've got the best part of an hour and a bit um i want to go and have a look at how we understand who you are and give you the right kind of permissions and get, have the right kind of communications with you. So this is a kind of next level. So we have this notion. We've started, we started off with um, responsible and we decided no responsible doesn't work. So if I use the term Rebecca manages NAPTAN stops, or Alex manages NAPTAN stops, what would that mean to you? What would that mean that that person does to you? Now, take a minute, just throw the stickies up and just let me know what manage, what somebody say, what saying that somebody manages NAPTAN stops means to you. Does it feel like the sort of thing that you do? Does it feel like something that somebody else does? Jay? Yes? I'm having difficulty with my laptop. I've not got access to Mural. And I don't know whether you can see me at the moment, so I'm not able to contribute okay. using sticky what notes. What we'll do, Stephen, is if you get a pen and a piece of paper and note things down, we'll go through and if your point of view is not captured, we'll add it as a sticky note when we go through and read them through. Is that OK? And yeah, I can I... see you. I can see you smiling. Oh, great stuff. I am. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's happening. My PC doesn't cope with the way I want it to work. 
that's been my experience of PCs and the or computers in the last day or so. So um, I'll give you another minute or so. I'll just quickly set a timer because I'll, I'll forget the time otherwise for a minute. OK. Is everyone finished? Would, would we like another 30 seconds or so? I can see Rebecca's face and, and, and Stephen's and nobody else's. So you two are the two people who I'm taking my cues from as to whether I'm going too fast or too slow. So I'm going to start off with this uh, uh, Oxfordshire. It means that they go out and plant the poles, update the flags and wash the timetable cases. I think that what I do is manage NAPTAN stop data, which means I don't get my hands dirty. Uh, seriously, though, thank you for I do appreciate the, the precision. Seriously, though, it means database management and dissemination of information internally. Can you all hear me okay? I just got a warning that my sound quality is fading. No, it seems to be fine. Um, they add, edit and remove stops from the NAPTAN or source database. Managing NAPTAN is different to managing stops. Stops to me would be the physical location, maintenance, etc. Managing NAPTAN is a database involved, keeping it up to date with any changes and stops and compliant with the schema. Okay, so managing NAPTAN stops data is where I need to put this. Create new stops, edit, remove, or move stops if required. Generally reflect current state of stops for the area. Uh, manage the accurate recording of new stops, stop movements, or stop removals. This includes the coordinates, naming, and attributes of the stop, the export of the data to NAPTAN. Uh, someone who enters new stops, changes, or deactivates stops in the data set. Looking after the naming, moving, and general administration of the NAPTAN stops in the system. No other person for that area should be doing this. Oh no, regional data managers manages the systems and data quality of many local authorities, often training the stop owners in the NAP, the stop owners in the system and the NAPTAN. A stop owner manager looks after the data for a specific local authority area. Is there anything that anyone is missing there? Stephen, did that kind of cover your thoughts on it? You're on mute. Apologies, I was kicked out, so I've not heard the old conversation. Um, so let me just read out what I wrote down and if it's duplicated and being said before, and apologies for duplicating it and repeating. Um, my, my notes I wrote down is a geographical information about the stop, um, information about what the stop is known at, the, uh, as the common name and the name that gets displayed in different systems. Um, and then various stop attributes that are hosted in different systems that refer to the stop. Cool, in different systems. Thank you. Um, that was a really good description of it. Um, Lee, you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's the word data set that I would say was is missing. I mean, if you say NAPTAN data set manager, I think everybody knows that you don't mean someone that's managing physical assets. Um, so I think the data set would be definitely the thing I'd want to put in there. Excellent. I've just put that up there. Um, Di. Hi, is the uh, looking forward, are we assuming Naptan is going to be just bus stops? Because currently it includes tax, taxi ranks, rail stations, Uncle Tom Cobbley and all. So we we tend to focus on stops here, but it's not actually reflecting the current situation. Um, I'm focusing on bus stops because they're currently 97% of the data set. Um, once we've got bus stops a little bit more sorted, yes, we will be fixing up some of the others. You might have seen in our scope plans, there was fix the 9x stops. Um, to give you an idea of the brokenness of some of the 9x stops. Um, we have so many thousand um, train stations, but we only have three platforms listed in NAPTAN. <laughs> and I know, yes, um, I know Elephant and Castle train station has five platforms. It, according to NAPTAN, it doesn't. Um, so these 
that's one of the things that we want to do to fix this up. And I know that that will start to start to reflect and balance out the numbers of stops more accurately. But by the way, we also have two Heathrow airports at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's just um, I'd like to put my hand up to say, can we scrap taxi ranks, please? Ah, <laughs> uh, um, I I honestly don't know, but 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 let's let's add that to the list of things that we go through and fix, and whether how we fix them, because we also need to include new things like electronic electric scooter racks and Boris bike racks or, or Santander bikes or whatever you call them, higher, higher by the hour bikes, but also where you can leave your electric higher by the hour bikes. So these are all things that need to come in. So this is the next stage that we need to look at. But at the moment, I'm just trying to get 97% of the data yeah. at least standing up on its own on its own feet. And then we'll sort out putting the rest of it in properly. Is that okay? I know that we're a bit over focused on bus stops. Um, so just moving on to the three layers, um, what we wanted to do because um, I wanted and what I wanted to do was think of three layers of who does what within NAPTAN. So um, because one of the problems that we've had with current NAPTAN is trying to figure out um, for some local authorities, not for you people because you're all engaging with us, but for some local authorities who we should talk to about errors that they've had in their NAPTAN files and things like this. And it's taken us quite a bit of effort to track people down. And also which we're uncovering that there's a difference between the Andy Hole and the Tansies who are acting as agents for a wide area of stops and the local authorities who are managing the stops and also the policy people who sit and are talking to our policy people about the policies of of stops and buses and trying to make sure that we understand where all those intersections are and where they should be. So we're proposing a three layer contact model of of people to have a NAPTAN. Now, whether these get permissions, what they get, this is all what I'm trying to figure out, but we just want to figure out as to whether we've got the right kind of three people or three hats. So we've got three people. We've got Kelly, who does policy management. We've got Rajani, who, do, who manages data. And we've got Jerry, who physically goes and takes the file from, from the, takes the output XML file, takes it to NAPTAN and puts the XML file into NAPTAN. So what I wanted to quickly understand from you all, and I know that those who aren't in local authorities might not be able to answer this one. Could you take a minute, and I'm going to set up a vote, although Stephen, that, that means that you can't vote. Could you take a minute and we'll just see, um, vote on the person as best you can. Um, I would like to see who feels closest to you. So I'm just going to give you one vote now. So if you if you just take your vote and click on which of these people, which of these descriptions feels closest to your role in your local authority. So I'm just trying to understand how people, how things are seen and how, how this works. I'd say for myself, Jay. Um, yeah. Ranji, Rajani. Rajani. Okay, cool. I've just put that in because I voted. I voted for that as me, Andrew, and Trisha. I'll go to Andrew first. Uh, I can't vote. Um, I'm probably all three. You're probably all three. So yeah. if you're all three, which one sounds closer? Uh, the, the the middle one, managing the data. Okay, so that's two for Rajani. I'll just put a note that there's. But there's two there. Uh, Trisha. Um, I was going to say it won't let me vote either, but I'm in the same situation as Andrew, so I'll stick myself in the middle as well. <laughs> okay, so that's three votes. Uh, Gordon. Sorry, same situation. I can't vote. I'm in all three, but it'd be the middle probably. Okay. Um, 
let me just end the voting session because obviously I think there's a problem. There's either a problem with the voting or it's not working. Um, and it looks like the majority of people are seeing themselves as Rajani who manages data with Kelly being the extra one. Uh, there's one person who sees themselves as being Kelly. Chris. Uh, yeah, I was kind of I was just adding myself to the list of people who think they're all three. Um, we don't share this. We're not a big organisation. We're just a regional county. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to find a model that even if somebody's all three, um, we understand that there are some places where there might be breakouts. Some of the bigger authorities have almost these three levels and some of them uh, the same person covers all three. So we're, we're going to try to figure out how to do that inside the data side. Um, Lee. I just wanted to say that obviously in my case, I manage the data on behalf of another authority. I work for Essex County Council. We have a contract with Thurrock Borough Council. So um, Thurrock Borough Council are essentially the policy management. They will tell us how they want their NAPTAN to look. Um, but I will be Rajani and Jerry uh, on their behalf. So there's that split there. Uh, that's really that's a really, really good point. So if we needed to contact somebody about Thurrock's policy, we would know who to go to. And if and then if we wanted to contact them ab about have did you upload in the last week and what's going on, which seems to be the rule, a rule that I'm needing to chase. Um, we would be contacting you because you're acting as that Rajani, a jury kind of level. Does that sound about right? That's exactly it. Yes, that's right. Rebecca. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that, uh, I mean, even though I, I sort of put myself down as Kelly, um, I was saw myself between uh, Rajani and Kelly, but then Stephen put Rajani, so I thought I better put Kelly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just because I'm a, I'm a line manager, so just like, well, go on then. Um, but it's it's just the way that it's split up within you know, the organisation. Like they each local authority is sort of set up a little bit differently, and we've got different areas that deal with different bits of it. Whether it's the bus services team or actually the physical infrastructure team, they'll actually physically go out and put a pole in the ground, and then there's some things that will will be sort of sorted out by the IT department. But in general, it, it it's it's me and my team who are the um, the point of contact, uh, we deal with the data, but with a point of contact. So even though some of these roles might be by somebody else in the organisation, my team is, is is that point of contact. And that's what that's some of what we're trying to understand, because I and it's it's a hard thing to do because we want to set up so that there's not a single point of contact because we've discovered there's a, been a few failings with that. We want to set it up so that we've got a wide just sec, I'm just going to mute somebody because they're chewing in my ear. Um, I'm just going to do a quick mute all. Um, my apologies if you're um, you will now need to unmute yourself to talk. Um, we want to try to figure out so that we don't have those single point of failures because we've we've found a few single point of failures which are causing us some concern. Um, the Midlothian story still continues for those who have been keeping up with it. We are still chasing down a contact for Midlothian. We 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 have some some new emails and we are talking with them. Gordon, please tell me you're from Midlothian and you know who we should be talking to. You might need to unmute yourself. I, I do have a name, but he may not thank me for passing it on. Um, and the head of the department about to change as well. And I think, Dr. J, this highlights a, a, a massive problem in Scotland. Um, I, I'm so jealous of the people who have got teams to talk to and can share about bus polls and data. Um, in Midlothian and Scottish Borders, it's one person. There is no team. So if you put the data, if you put your decision making too high, it's going to arrive in a mailbox which no one is ever going to read. And that's one of the things that we wanted to sort out. We just want to ensure that we've got two contacts or three contacts for 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 every single local authority, just so that if somebody isn't responding, we can figure out a way. And Gordon, um, 
uh, I'll put my email address up on here. It's well known everywhere. Everyone seems to know it now. But please message me the person's details. And, I will do. Um, that would be amazing because we've really struggled. We got in contact with somebody and they then retired. We They then passed us on to somebody else who hasn't been responding. So I'm, I'm kind of stuck a little bit with, with trying to find out um, what Midlothian has been I'll, doing. I'll get you a live name and, and it absolutely highlights the issue that you've got and we've got with, with Naptan. The person was moved jobs um, onto a, a, a juicier career and told the authorities straight that he was dumping one job to do the other and um, where mm -hmm. they expected both jobs done. So a wee bit of politics there, but um, I share your grief. Yep. Um, it, it is a reality. It's not you're out of the loop. There is no loop. Yeah, thank you. I really, really, really appreciate that because I know that it's also, there's a wide discrepancy or disparity that's the word I wanted disparity between different local authorities as to how much resources they've got to handle NAPTAN and we want to make sure that whatever we do is proportionate and we give people all of the help that they need especially to bring somebody on in an emergency or to help people out um, with quick edits and, and things like that because it doesn't make sense to put so much weight on smaller authorities as no, well when there's and, sorry I, I think one of the saving graces is rtpi is forcing um scottish authorities and probably other ones to address this so while um there's been a lot of disinterest the fact is you can't do rtpi if you don't have a form of naptan um and you know for so that, that's a live issue but we just need to build its um its importance Thank you, and I really appreciate that. And I, I, I will probably actually offer to do a coffee with you at some point and talk through this in much more depth. Rebecca. Thank yep. Thank you. Uh, just sticking my oar in again. Um, I just want to say that um, you know, if you were, if if you're wanting like more than one point of contact, and you're looking at these different um, sort of uh, different types of contact. The way we get around it, like I say, it is, it is my team that is that point of contact at, at whatever level. But the way we get around that, so you don't have somebody that's left or whatever, is we we have a group email that we use. So no matter, you know, what what the issue, whether somebody's left or whatever, that's the what, why we have a group email. Um, and there are like, you know, in the actual smaller team that deals with it, there'll be five people that can pick that up. If it's the wider team, it's like nine people that could pick it up. So there's always going to be, hopefully, <laughs> somebody hopefully. left in that team <laughs> that, that, that will, you know, and, and will hopefully be replaced if they leave to actually mm. pick up on that and always work that through. So you're never going to have the situation where you've got dead emails because somebody's left. Um, I mean, is, is that something that, that is, is possible so we don't have individual emails? Uh, now, this, uh, I'll answer this before we go to Tricia. This leads us to a little bit of a security problem of we we shouldn't be doing accounts that are group accounts. We And this is one of the questions that we've got because if we do group accounts, we can't tell who's uploading to them. We can't lock them out specifically and it creates a little bit more uh, security um, surface for attacks to happen. Is there if a maximum a group number account of accounts you can have? I because that's the problem. My, the, the team that deals actually deals with the Naptan uploading. There are four people within that team that would essentially, on a rotor, change to whether they are the person doing it. Sort of like every three months or so, they would change so that nobody ever forgets how to do it. Basically, yeah. So it's not always going to be the same person that will be doing I that particular role. I don't think we would have a maximum of accounts. This is me trying to figure out the levels of accounts that I need to do. And then we'll figure out, OK, how many accounts could somebody have within that? Because what we want to also start doing is um, not quite personal personal tracking, but, but if we say, oh, we expected to see a file come through from West, West Yorkshire on Tuesday and it didn't come through, we can have a look as to who uploaded the previous week and contact them. Then we've got all of that understanding of who was doing what on the system, because that's a big security thing that we haven't 
not to reveal too much, we may not have to quite the same extent on current NAPTAN. But it helps you, doesn't it, track if there is an issue with something, you, you, you know the yeah. person that has actually done that and they are more likely yeah. to be able to sort it out. Yeah, and we can talk to the person straight away. And this is one of the trying to get that um, feedback loop a lot faster because it currently takes about a day and a half or more for the feedback to come around if there's been an issue. Whereas with new NAPTAN, we've been playing around a little bit with it. You might have been getting emails from me when you've uploaded and we're starting to do things within minutes. Like um, we can see when you've uploaded something and it's it's caused an issue and we can get hold of you almost straight away. But one of the problems of getting hold of people is we don't quite know who to get hold of because we can't tell from current NAPTAN who did it. So we've got to kind of just go, OK, we've got five people. Let's blanket email them and figure out who might have done it. And we turns out to be somebody else, somebody else at that local authority. So this is kind of a little bit of where we're trying to drive to. But here I'm just trying to figure out the levels and whether I've got the levels right. And then we can figure out a little bit more on where things go. Does that make sense to everybody? Trisha. Sorry, I was just going to add to that that we're the same. We have a generic email address because there is actually only four of us that, you know, we do data information and we install everything and deal with maintenance and the whole lot. You know, we don't have separate teams, but could there not be a way where you set up somebody's account for uploading, but also have, do you, is there a secondary team email address that we can contact in your absence? And so you, you, that... you suddenly have two email addresses. That's a really, really cool idea. And that's some of what I want to go on to in the next one. Um, so I'm going to skip past who would you sign to each in your organization because I think we've got the levels kind of right, but there's going to be some fine finessing and I'll definitely get back to those. So taking a deep breath, uh, I got a little bit vote-tastic. You might remember that I did this last time as well. Um, yeah, we've got enough time. Um, I want to just go through this. So what I want to really understand, because this is really key to the next thing that I want to st that we want to start investigating and building and testing out is who needs to know what when. So we've got a whole pile of voting and I know that some of you might have trouble voting, but we'll see how we go. So, for example, I want to know if, for example, my local authority nap 10 file uploaded successfully should we tell jerry should we tell rajani should we tell kelly now it doesn't matter who did it it's who should we tell who should we let know that this happened so i'm going to set up a first quick vote and hopefully you are all able to vote on these let me just go voting session start voting session upload nap 10 um, I'm going to give you three votes because anyone, uh, you could vote, you could say that all three need it. Um, you don't need to use all of your votes, so you can throw them all on one person. Um, and just on this first one, I want you to vote on, on the green stickies that say Kelly, Rajani or Jerry. And I'm just waiting for Mural to kick itself to life. If you can see me, I am just clicking on something, hoping that it will actually go. Has it died? It's died. Let me just try again. Start voting session. Update NAPTAN. My apologies. Upload NAPTAN. Three, next. There we go. Begin voting. So click on the green icons as to whether it's Kelly, Rajani or Jerry. Stephen, I know that you've got an issue voting, so you're going to tell me your votes and you're on mute. They keep catching me out. I said Jerry, but you didn't hear. So, so I should throw all three votes on Jerry. Yeah. OK, I've done that. So we've got six people voting. People are getting themselves through. Um, Tim and Visiting Tuk Tuk. Oh, no, Visiting Tuk Tuk's gone, so it's just Tim Rivet. Tim, I hope you don't mind. I'm, I'm not going to wait for you. I'm not gonna... voting this because I'm not an authority. Excellent, excellent. So, Jerry won out with votes, 
and then Rajani and then Kelly, and then we've got a couple of unique voters. We'll find out where those were. Ah, we voted one across, but that's okay. Um, I'll sort these out and put the numbers on. So we've got Kelly, Rajani, but Jerry was most definitely the winner. So Jerry is definitely the person who needs to be told and Rajani probably needs to be told and Kelly might want to be told. So this is how I might think about how we're going to set up the permissions like Kelly, um, Jerry would definitely always be told when this happened. Rajani might subscribe to it as might Kelly. So that's how I'm kind of thinking about it from the results that we got. So just moving on, what I'm going to do is we're going to go a little bit funky. We'll see if it works. We're going to vote on my LTA Neptune file didn't upload OK. A chosen LA's Neptan file uploaded successfully. So this is another local authority from, from the one that you're working at. And a stop failed an automatic business rule check. So if there's an automatic business rule, for example, a stop needs to be so many meters from water and it's failed that business rule check, who should know? So I'm going to set up a voting session. I'm going to give you three votes. I'm going to give you nine votes and you're going to vote on the, each of those columns as to who you think should know in that situation. Does this make sense to everybody? It's a little bit complicated. It's going to be a little bit crazy. Right. Chaos one. Chaos one. We're going to get nine votes. And off we go. Begin voting. Stephen, we're, we're going to give people a minute or so and then you'll tell me your votes for, for each of those three. OK, I don't quite understand what the third one is. Uh, I think I've just, fails. Actually, I've just found this out, sorry. So the um, first one is my LTA NAPTAN file didn't upload OK. Are you asking yeah. for votes on that? Yes, um, I'd please. give that to Jerry. OK, on put three the on Jerry. Shows an yep. LTA's NAPTAN file uploaded successfully. Three on Jerry again. OK, and so that's um, and the neighbouring authority. Yeah, we do process yep. from South Yorkshire, another district. So I'd only do that for a district we're processing data for. I wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. want that for West Yorkshire, where we don't need to know what they're doing. Yeah, that, and then the last that makes one, sense. And then fine. Yeah, the stop fails an automated business rule check. Um, it would be Jerry again, three votes. OK. Nice and simple. Right, how are we going with everyone else? We've got four people voting. So we've got Rowboat, Natasha and Visiting Taxi, who has minus one votes. I don't know how you manage that. And there's some tester who's very happy at seeing minus one votes. Di, you've got a comment. Yeah, it's just that here, for all of these jobs, it's me. So I um, tend to be putting my votes on Rajani because that's, if you like, what I think I do. But really, I yeah. do all of those jobs. So it, whatever structure you end up getting or devising, there needs to be a thing where it doesn't have to be three different people that get notified. It, that They could no. all just be the same person. They could all be the same person. It's trying to figure out the, the, the difference between a must be a uh, must be notified and uh, would like to be notified and I'm just trying to figure that out a little bit um, and that's why I'm kind of teasing this out to get your thoughts on how these might look don't worry I'm not I this is very early exploratory we're not going to do many decisions based on my hand wavy stuff this is just kind of trying to understand what the what the world looks like from your viewpoint yeah and I know I mean, Di, that I'm you're very Rajani yeah, I, I represent five different authorities or I do the data for five. But in terms of Kelly's responsibilities, if you talk to any one of those five authorities, they probably haven't got a faintest idea what NAPTAN is. You know, it's just something that happens for them. I can totally I can I, I can totally understand. And that is one of those interesting questions because it becomes how do we get some of the policy decisions down to those people and ensure that it it it's understood in a way that doesn't impact on you and they can actually have the right level of conversations and the right questions to take back. 
Yeah. Um, and we, we do the right communications. So we just did a quick check. Let me just zoom in for a second. So for my NAPTAN file, it didn't upload OK. Jerry, definitely. Rajani and a little bit of Kelly. For chosen LTA's NAPTAN file uploaded successfully, Jerry and Rajani and very little Kelly. For a stop fails and automated business rule check, Jerry and Rajani and very little Kelly. OK, that's that's kind of what we expect. So I'm going to do the next row all as one big go again. So these are the ones to vote on. A new member of the team is added to new NAPTAN. So say, for example, Rebecca, we add a new person and who would need to be told for your local transport authority that somebody has been added? This is more of a confirmation or to let you know that we've added a new person. DFT wants to talk about a new regional policy paper. So who would we go talk to? Who would we start that contact with? That one's kind of obvious, but I still want to double check. DFT wants to talk about a new NAPTAN schema. So who would we start that engagement with? And I know that yous will all be involved in the, in the detail, but who do we start that engagement with? And then a bus operator needs to contact the local transport authority. So a bus operator wants to say, uh, for example, um, uh, we need some new stops in place or I'm trying to I'm trying to put I'm trying to route around these stops and I can't seem to at the moment. Can you can you help me figure this out? So those four. Those four, I'm going to give you 12 votes and vote on the green stickies for, for each of those. I think you've all got the plan. Start voting session chaos two. Two. Twelve. And there we go. Begin voting. So we'll give people a minute and then Stephen will go through with me and give me his votes unless magically your your laptop has decided to work again, Stephen. And you're on mute. I've not been able to guess on the oral, so I, I gave up trying because I won't be able to concentrate on the oral presentation and discussions. Um, would you mind just bringing the screen so I can see the three names again? I don't have a good yeah, sure. short term memory. <laughs> That's OK. So so if a new member is added to the to the new NAPTAN, should it be Kelly? Who is a policy? So that would be policy. the manager, the manager. Yep. Is that so Rajani? Yep, in the middle. Yep. Three yep. votes. Three votes. So DFT wants to talk about a new regional policy paper. That would be the um, policy. Setter, the first one. Yep. Yep. Cool. Uh, DFT. Oh. I'd go for the manager. For Rajani and a bus operator needs to contact the local transport authority. Manager again. Cool. Thank you very much. Let's see how everyone else is going. We've got visiting Robo and Trisha. Still to go. You might need to put a couple of extra votes on somebody there, Tricia. There we go. I will end the voting session. End session for everybody. Kelly Radani, Radani. Yeah, we'll just see how this all broke out. So very, very, very high level. A new member of a new member of the team is added to new NAPTAN. We pretty much are in agreement that Rajani is the, very much the person who needs to know that, with Kelly and Jury possibly wanting to know. DFT wants to talk about a new policy, regional policy paper. It's Kelly. That was that was kind of one of those easier ones with a little bit of Rajani. DFT wants to talk about NAPTAN schema. This is split between Kelly and Rajani, which is quite interesting. And a bus operator needs to contact the LA. It's mostly Rajani with a little bit of Jerry and Kelly. Fantastic. So we've got two last very quick ones and then we're going to go on to the next piece. So I'm going to give you six votes. First one is an issue with a bus stop is reported by a member of the public. So a member of the public wants to tell somebody that the bus stop outside of their house has been demolished by a car driving or a truck drove through it and there is no longer a bus stop there. And the other one is an issue with a stop needs to be reported by a bus operator. So a bus operator has been trying to stop somewhere and they're like, look, the road's changed. This has changed. A tree, a tree has grown over and it's really hard to get the bus in and out. And can we move the bus stop or fix the tree? 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the last bit of voting and I'm going to give you six, vo six votes. There we are. So vote on who should know for both of those. And Stephen, which, who do you think? For both of them, it will be the um, data processor. So that's that's the bottom person, Jerry. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much for that. That that was very decisive and very fast. So let me just check. We've got uh, visiting sheep and visiting rowboat. <sighs> Lee. Oh, sorry, Andrew and Lee. I didn't see your hands up. Andrew first. Um, I'm not. I'm wondering what these have really got to do in that time. Um, there's <laughs> been a request. There is. There was a, a, a long. There's been a long-standing request that's come through from the bus operators via BODS of right. they want to know who to talk to should a bus stop not work, and then the second one came through again from BODS to say how does a member of the public contact somebody to say about the bus stop? So while it's got not a lot to do with NAPTAN, it's more trying to understand who they would talk to because it might be that we say if you want to talk if you want to report a problem with a bus stop here and there's a contact form that goes that sends it to the right email or something like that i don't know i'm just being asked to kind of look into these two right because um, in lincolnshire we've just recently started using fix my street a lot more so uh -huh. if, if, if there's an issue with a bus stop that's been damaged or vandalized then that goes through to our infrastructure team to look at um and again if a, if a bus operator has an issue we always point them in the direction of fix my street so that because uh it's it's likely that the bus stop might be owned by the county council but if it's a shelter it might be owned by a parish council or or, or various different bodies that aren't even related to the county council so i i don't see those as, as naptan issues at all because it, the physical infrastructure on the street is a completely separate team that's really good to know um, and that also helps me explain to the people bringing this to me uh, a little bit more of that complexity because again they're seeing bus stop as bus stop they're not seeing the difference between a physical bus stop and a digital bus stop yeah. um, Lee and then Chris uh, I, had to, I had to step away briefly so apologies if I'm I'm repeating and um, but really just the same as um, the last comment really in that we do have a completely separate team for infrastructure and it wouldn't be appropriate within our organisation for um, Kelly Rajani or Jerry to be told about um, a physical problem with a bus stop that would go to the infrastructure team so um, I imagine that's probably the case in quite a few large authorities. That's really really good to know. Um, so Chris I can back that up as well Jay on South Yorkshire's perspective we have a separate infrastructure team uh, but as a last course contacting the data processor okay yep that's yeah, good I, I would say that we've used fix my street for a number of years but it's it's <laughs> it has to be set up correctly and I don't think it would be any harm in having a um, a reference suit to the NAPTAN data management because the infrastructure teams go out, clear up a mess and fail to tell the NAPTAN team because they don't know we exist. So I think it's a matter of if it's in there, it's a bit of extra information. You can um, disregard it or you can use it. OK, um, I appreciate that. Regard or use. I'm just making some quick notes here. Um, Lee. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify, it, it, um, it occurred to me that there can be some confusion when we talk about infrastructure team. Um, when I say infrastructure team, I mean the, the team of people who manage our infrastructure and are based at our county hall office. Obviously, you have operatives on the roadside um, who are quite often a contracted company. Um, so when I say infrastructure team, I mean the email should go to somebody managing the infrastructure. OK, yep, yep, email to infra manager cool that makes sense but sometimes that we're the same person am i the only authority that does both is trisha the only i'm i'm about to ask gordon 
Uh, well, we, it, we're not necessarily the same team, but I know who it is. So, um, so I, I don't know who deals with it, but we're not necessarily the same line manager. The the, uh, the person who we were voting for well, that would be Kelly. We've got different Kellys, if you see what I mean. I totally, I totally, totally see. You. So there's a Kelly, Kelly infrastructure, well, and a Kelly Naptan. Totally got that. Uh, let me end this voting session, and I might need to. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, and let's just see how this went. Yes, most of it was for Rajani with a little bit of Jerry and Kelly, and for this one, it was Rajani with just a little bit of Jerry. So that makes a lot of sense. So we've got half an hour left, and we're doing okay. We've we've actually got through stuff. We've done who needs to know. So now I'm going to ask you who dad. Um, what I want to know, this is the two examples. I want to sign up for NAPTAN for XXX local authority. And as an imposter, I want to sign up for NAPTAN as XXX local authority. Now, this is one of the scenarios that we need to, cons that we need to consider for security. So what would be proportionate for you, for us to do to confirm that it's you? What is What are the things that we could do to say if we if somebody says I want to sign up for this, how how do we know that it's Rebecca Rowe? How do we know that it's Stephen? Do we get in contact with Rebecca? Do we get in contact with Stephen? Do we only accept it if Rebecca sends it through? What are the things that we should do to tell the difference in who that? Because this is a really thorny issue. And it's really difficult because I can come up with a thousand and one ways of doing it, none of which will be proportionate or very useful. Um, we don't need to know your blood type, for example. Um, so I was going to say, take a minute, take a couple of minutes. I'm going to pause for breath. Um, and I was just going to let you put your thoughts down as to how we would tell. How should we verify that it's you? Should we give you a phone call? Should we make sure that your email address ends in the right thing? What are the things that we should do to confirm that the person saying to us, I want an account for new NAPTAN for this local transport authority is actually somebody who should have it? And this is a tricky one, I know. So I'm going to set a timer for five and I'm going to give you five minutes to put your thoughts up. And Stephen, if you note stuff down and then I'll talk through them and we'll go back through them. OK. Right, as I see people have stopped typing, I'll start off on this. So we've got suggest an online application and a verifying email to both manager and applicant. So that's, for example, sending it to a Rajani or a Kali to say we've received something from this person. Do you approve? Do you say yes, no, and we'll do like a yes, no in the email or something. There'll be something relatively easy in there. Um, check with a local authority user that is already registered to use the service, which is very, very similar. Um, email address will reference the local authority. There's ways of spoofing email addresses. It's not that common, but um, most most people's email addresses are pretty good. Um, in many cases, there is a regional manager who does not change roles as often as stop owners. So this is the Rajani Kali level. Don't don't change as often as the Jerry level. The majority of stop owners can be identified by the domain name and the email address. LTAs will have an email address which end in a set format. May be difficult if managed by an external company, but still contact local transport authority for confirmation. So this is where, for example, Andy Hole would fall slightly outside of that. So if Andy had a new person for a particular local authority, their email address wouldn't look like the local authority email addresses. So this is kind of one of those little things. Um, Andy first and uh, then Stephen. No. Yeah, sorry. No, all my stop owners are belong to local authorities. So everyone that manages the data that I look after, uh, they enter the data in the system, are all local authorities. So they'll have the localauthority.gov.uk email address. Excellent. It'll only Excellent. be me that doesn't. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it's trying to figure out the rules or the systems that we put in place. Um, S Stephen. Yeah, sure. Thank you. The um, SIPSI, South Yorkshire Passenger Transport Executive, is per se a local authority. Um, we represent South Yorkshire, but our email address is a commercial one. It gives you an indication that it's a commercial organisation. It's sipti.co.uk. That is going to change, but the issue now is that you can't necessarily read from the email address that it's a local authority that's contacting you. That's a that's a super, super point because that's trying to understand where, what's proportionate and where those levels are because it's sounding like even just looking at the email address, we won't be able to tell for some people. Uh, Andy? On that? Though, like like my domain name would be nationalpci.co.uk, sipti.co.uk would be one of the authorised or, you know, known uh, known domain names. So it could be added to a, an acceptable list, perhaps. Mm. So so we'd need to create a list of acceptable domain names. Um. Verify sorry, an admin account. Okay, sorry. sorry. Um, we're, we're evolving into a different organisation, so our email address will change. So the acceptable list needs to be kept up to date, and that change is perhaps going to be quite instant. We, one day we're a .co.uk, the next day we become a .gov.uk. Really good point, and that's one of the things that... I, this is why I don't like email addresses as the sole way of figuring out who somebody is. I much prefer contacting somebody else and getting that second layer approval, but that creates, that's a little bit more work. So I'm just, we're trying to figure out what I said, proportionate and sort that out. Um, Lee. Um, I was just sort of arguing with myself really about how much of an issue this is. I mean, in the first instance, I thought, well, actually, yes, you could have someone who tries to corrupt Naptan, you know, maybe a, uh, a foreign country and they're always sort of trying to hack into everything and cause a bit of disruption. So um, I won't mention the Chinese or the Russians. Um, but um, on the other hand, um, it's difficult enough getting some local authorities to even try to update Naptan. I'm trying to get someone else who, who isn't being paid to do it. Maybe, maybe does the problem actually exist, I think is what I'm asking, but I don't know. Um, it's one of the, so in creating an account, it's one of the things that we need to consider is how do we know that the person is who the, who they say that they are. Um, it's kind of one of those security things that, that you do um, with a lot of systems of just verification or validation that the person is who they, who they say that they are. Um, there might also be some email validation that we need to do. These are all the little things that I need to go away and think of as to what is proportionate to what we need and what is also going to meet the security requirements that will come through because it's open data, but the ability to edit the open data is one of the things that we need to really consider. Um, it may be an idea to review and confirm access annually. Yes because I believe we might have some dead people in our database, not just dead as in the accounts are dead, I mean dead as in the person has since retired and retired completely, um, and we still have their accounts within the current NAPTAN system. And they may very well still be being used because people are using, I believe that some people might be using accounts because the local authorities have been around for so long and nobody's handed over. They haven't gone to get a new account. They've just handed on the account details. I know this because somebody accidentally sent me their account details. Um, in many cases, there is a regional manager who does not change roles as often as stop owner for any request check back with an existing person on the account. Those all sound really good, and I will sit down and have a look through those and figure out how we're going to do this and make this happen. Here's so, a thought which I wasn't able to post, which was to yeah. use two-factor two factor, two factor authentication. If somebody emails a request to be added to the list, they have to respond to 
a verification email confirming that they're the owner of that email address. That's a good one as well. Um, so, so a verification. Um, oh no, it's not verification. Verification of ownership of emails. So that that's really really good. Thank you for that. Um, is there anything else that we need to cover here? So uh, I'm going to run on to feedback and there's two little bits of feedback. So the first one is very, very, very quickly. I believe I have figured out the one out of the 137, I've found the 138th business rule um, for new NAPTAN. And this is a business rule that we're thinking of putting into the system. We need to figure out how many stops would be Im implicated by this, but also it doesn't need an exception. It's and the reason for putting in business rules is you can check a certain number of things using the XML schema. So the XML schema will say if it's not if it's this kind of field, but it's too long, we'll mark it as invalid and things like that. Business rules are checking for things that need to be checked outside of the schema. So it's like comparing two fields or checking if this field is this, then there's one of these there. Those are the sort of business rules that have to happen. Now, one of the things that we were trying to find was a good valid business rule that definitely didn't wouldn't have any exceptions because any of the business rules that we could put in at the moment, for example, a bus stop can't be too close to water. I know of bus stops on Waterloo Bridge that will trigger that and bus stops on Tower Bridge that will trigger that. So we've got to build, go in and mark this as an exception to that rule. And that's an extra layer of work that we don't want to do for this MVP for setting up business rules. So I think we've found a business rule. The business rule is for any element, the modification date must be after the created date. And believe it or not, we have some where the, where the modification date is 2021, but the created date is 2022. We don't know how people have done it, we don't quite know what system they've done. This is one of the things the BAs are going to be going through and sorting out. But this is one of the things, this is what we think is going to be a really good business rule just to run across the system to help everybody get their data and get their data quality an extra notch up and just make sure that everything's totally okay within your systems. There's been no tweaks with dates or anything like that. So very, very, very quickly, going to do a super fast super quick voting session and I just want you to go yes this is a good business rule we should do it no this is not a good business rule we shouldn't do it or don't know I don't know what this business rule means and we shouldn't we shouldn't even attempt it so I'm just going to quickly do a voting session and give you all one vote And if anyone's got any thoughts on it, also please just jump in and let me know. But just voting on the green stickies, yes, no, or don't know, would be really useful. Uh, Gordon. Sorry, Jay. Sorry, Jay, my voting's not working. But I would say that you, you have to be careful with the modification date because, um, you know, we plan ahead and then some street structure changes. Um, so it, I could conceive the if you put it in a month before and then on the, the day before it, it has to change, then you could trip yourself up for no reason, really. So this is why we wanted to check it, but it's also why we're trying to understand how systems have modification dates and created dates that are so wildly different. Um, and wildly out of sync for a couple of local authorities. And we thought that this might be a really good one to put in. I know a lot of the systems wouldn't allow this, but some of them appear to. So we're just trying to tease this out. Um, but Gordon, I'll definitely be giving you a, a yell and having, and I'll look through your data as well and see if you have any of the violations. And if you do, we'll have a really good chat. Andy. In our database, we don't store the created date. So we only have the last update or the last modified date. So surely if if the NAPTAN system, as the NAPTAN system is the master data in, in, in essence, the created date will be entered once you, the first time that stop has been uploaded, why would it never need, ever need to be changed again by the base system? 
Uh, now, here's an interesting one, Andy. I'm going to double check, but I think your system does actually give us the creator dates, even if it doesn't do it explicitly in the front end, it's doing it in the XML that it's giving us. So every single change that you make, the first time that you do it, it creates a creation date and then a modified date that are kind of seconds apart. And then from then on, the modified date, any changes that you make, the modified date should increment and change. But there's been a few weirdnesses in there where the modified dates are either set I to 1970, which means that they're a default, or the modified dates haven't been catching up. So we're just trying to figure out if this is a reasonable thing to run through and try and tidy up. And I'll explain my craziness again in a, in a or where this might lead us in the future in a bit. Die. OK, I think our created date goes on the export as as I export it, but OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it goes in and I can talk you through it and I'm more than happy to spend time talking through because this happens for every single element, but it's kind of like allowing us, to, it will allow us to do some really funky things if we can clean up this little bit of data. Die. Uh, it needs to be greater than or equal to because you can make a change on the same day as the created date. Uh, uh, sorry, it's a spelling mistake. I should say modified date time. It actually stamps it down to microseconds. Right. And right. in one okay. case, it stamps it down to a ridiculously precise precision. I think it's like seven or eight decimal places of a second, at which point we think there might be something a little bit broken with that particular uh, system. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop voting and just see if people understood. Uh, three people said yes, one person said no, and a few people said don't know. That's completely fine. Um, I totally understand. This is a new thing and a new idea. So one of the reasons for sorting out this data is it means effectively I could create a, I could create a query of NAP10 that says, tell me everything that was updated since this morning. And that, and that means that I might get only the changes from this morning that I could then put into my database. But if we have modified and created dates that are all a little bit weird, we can't quite run that query smoothly. So that's kind of a lot of what we're trying to do is just have a look and make sure that our modified dates and our created dates are both valid and time stamped and all of those things into the right kind of precision. And then also that allows us to build some really funky things in the future that says Andy updated um, Andy did an update and these things changed on it and we can do these things changed on it by looking at the modified date times. So this is allowing us to build out the deltas or the changes between two files in a really nice simple way. So somebody can say um, what Andy uploaded his files today, um, how many things actually changed on those files? Well Andy uploaded 36 files but there were only five stops that changed. And it's kind of allowing us to see what is what's better, uploading constantly or being able to see what what's actually changed and being able to see how those things changed. Does that make sense to everybody? I know it's a little bit it's a bit wild and a bit crazy and it might take us a bit of time, but if we do this, I think we can get to that. Tim and then Stephen. Yeah, uh, see. So the whole thing of version control and um, creation and modification dates and version numbers is something that quite a number of suppliers have had to get their head around with the BODS trans exchange profile. Um, so hopefully people have, at least the big suppliers, most of whom also do NAPTAN software, uh, understand the concept of version control now. So you shouldn't have to be telling them how to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. That's good to know, Tim. Um, Stephen and then Lee. Yeah, I, I didn't cast a vote because I can't. I'd have cast a yes vote, though, so you, you know, the need to increment on that. And also, is the issue a legacy issue where if you're asking the user to type in those dates and times and it's using their system default, you're not maybe using a reliable time source. So should the date and time for both of those elements be captured from the server system? And it, the services for them sets the creation date 
the modification date using a reliable time source? Um, that would be important, I think, if we wanted to get down to the seconds. But given that Naptan, um, been keeping an eye on who's uploading Naptan and how many times a day Naptan changes, and we get maybe three files a day unless um, Andy uploads, and we, we get a huge bulk of files. But if we get three files in a day, it's been a really busy day on the on the Naptan upload. So I don't think we need that precision. Stephen, I, I don't think we need to go to like a network clock or an atomic clock. It's more just making sure that everyone's systems are doing the right things with created and modified and versions, which would be the next one of in version, version number exists and version number is greater than the previous version number. Uh, Lee. Um, just for the avoidance of doubt, I just wanted to um, clarify, we're talking about the creation date of an individual stop point. Um, I've just uh, opened up Thorax Naptan and I can see that the, the creation dates do, I haven't checked every one of them, but the creation dates are sort of 2004, 2005 and so on, and then the modification dates are later. But the actual file itself, the actual um, creation date at the top of the whole file is today like just now when i created yep. the file so yep. i just wanted to clear up we're talking about the stop not the file we're talking we're talking about the stop element so so for every stop element there's a creation date and time um for every stop area as well and um this should also be a modified date and time and in some systems there appears to have been a little bit of an oops and either they're being written back to front or something's allowed them to be set into the future or sometimes they're actually set to 1970 and that's a default number we know from a lot of Linux systems. So we're just trying to identify the ones that are not sane and not right. And this would be the nice little business rule that would allow us to do some of that. Um, so we've got five minutes left. So just really super quick, just thinking about today's session. I'd really love your feedback because your feedback has helped us. It's helped us to iterate all the time to make sure that these are interesting sessions, that they're on point, that we kind of keep to time. I've gotten better at keeping to time, you might notice. Today is finishing on time, not running over. Um, and But also that they're worthwhile, that you feel like they're worthwhile. So um, in the last five minutes, just t take a few minutes and then we'll, we'll just chit chat. Um, Put down what gave you joy, what was good and useful from today's session, what frustrated you, what was not good or useful, and what made you sad, what things were missing, what things should have happened today that we didn't cover off. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for your time and for your attention. I know these are not the most exciting things that you could do for two hours on a whatever day it is afternoon, Thursday afternoon. Um, but I really, really appreciate you coming along and giving us your thoughts and your ideas. Andy Hole. Um, I've just checked mine and my creation date for every stop is the date and time down to nine decimal places, but it's a thing. Uh, of the time it's exported, not when the stop was created. So the modified date is right, which is a date and time to a minute um, accuracy, but I've got something going on with my creation date, which I'll try and get sorted. <laughs> thank you. I really, you really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's really good. And thank you for, um, thank you for coming forward for kind of looking into that so quickly because I had a sense that yours might have been one of them because the nine decimal places was definitely one of the things that we looked at and I was screaming with, I, I mean, the things that make me laugh are, are, are weird, but getting a timestamp to nine decimal places was definitely one of them. Um, I just wanted to address the 137 rules. One of the reasons that we're not trying to implement them in bulk is that we're trying to identify the ones that are really valuable um, because some of them, there's a lot, uh, there's some previous public meetings that you can, um, you're welcome to go through. And I'm more than happy to go back through the business rules again, um, should people feel that it's valid. Um, we couldn't find any really good business rules that made sense, that provided value to people. Um, there seems to be a lot of business rules that have come in for some reasons at some points. And 
either they're not valid now or there's so many stops that need to be exceptions to them that they're actually very, very, they'd be very, very difficult to implement. So we're trying to look at what business rules we can implement so that somebody doesn't have to spend a day or more going through going, that's an exception and that's an exception and that's an exception. Because I know, um, for example, with the bearings and automated calculation of bearings, if the stop hasn't linked to the right street, if the stop isn't actually linking to exactly the right street, it'll read the bearing, it'll, the system will tell us, or our automated systems will tell us the bearing the wrong way around, especially if there's two one-way streets side by side with a narrow, um, a narrow passage between them. If the bus stop is kind of being read slightly to the, slightly to the wrong side by some software, it'll be read as being going the wrong way up a one-way street and things like this. So we want to make sure that whatever business rules we put in, they provide the most value possible and they provide the, they help us get better data into NAPTAN. They're not just creating extra work for you to go through and, and do things with your NAPTAN because that doesn't feel like it's worthwhile. Um, so that's pretty much it. Thank you everybody for your time, your attention, your thoughts, your feedback. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and have a lovely evening. I think the one we're doing next week, I think it is, is around data quality. I'm trying to figure out what we're going to talk. I We'll talk about a lot on data quality and it's trying to understand it will touch on business rules. It will also touch on how we're looking at data quality. What are the sort of things that we want to do as a group to make data quality better? And trying to understand where there's some tension, where there's some problems between local authorities. Or well, not problems. People have moved slightly one way and over the years we're doing something slightly different. Uh, Stephen. Um, so, yeah, cheers. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>